Now we have to return to Jean-Michel Basquet, who is exactly the same artist that we dealt with in street art when we were dealing with the Samo street art or graffiti. Now, Basquet's work is one of the few examples of how an early 1980s American punk or graffiti-based and countercultural practice could become a fully recognized, critically embraced, and popularly celebrated artistic phenom. Indeed, not unlike the rise of American hip-hop during the same era. Despite his work's unstudied appearance, Basquet very skillfully and purposefully brought together in his art a host of disparate traditions, practices, and styles to create a unique kind of visual collage, one deriving in part from his urban origins and in another more distant African-Caribbean heritage. Now, for some critics, his swift rise to fame and equally swift and tragic death by drug overdose epitomized and personified the overly commercial, hyped-up, international art scene of the mid-1980s. A commercial phenom that for many observers was systematic or symptomatic of the largely artificial bubble economy of the era. Now, his work is an example of how American artists of the 1980s could reintroduce the human figure into their work after the wide success of minimalism and conceptualism, thus establishing a dialogue with the more distant tradition of 1950s abstract expressionism. So by focusing on an actual image, something concrete, uh, unlike conceptual art, where usually that discussion, that image, is a little bit ambiguous. Because we're dealing with something concrete, we're kind of hearkening back to the age of Jackson Pollock, Mark Rothko, uh, Clifford Still, and others. Now, we need to look at one of a couple of his pieces, including Untitled 1982. And this is like a page pulled cleanly from a daily artist journal. This untitled canvas features his personal iconography, some reminiscent of that of Paul Clay. Here he's boldly appropriating images commonly associated with African art. For example, a skull, a bone, and an arrow. He modernizes them with his neo-expressionist style of thickly applied paint, rapidly rapidly rendered subjects, and scrawling linear characters, all of which float loosely across the pictorial field as though hallucinatory. So it's a very loose conglomeration of these items. They don't seem clearly associated. And so he's leaving that element of interpretation up to the viewer. Why is there a bone, an arrow, a skull, the scales? What does it come down to? What does it mean? A white skull juts from the center of the ebony composition, vividly recalling a revered painter's tradition of the memento mori, a reminder of the ephemeral nature of all life and the body's eventual, merciless degradation. He also demonstrates in this one study how he is able to carry on an ancient practice of painting still life, all the while suggesting, as does a great jazz musician, that the artist's work was relatively effortless, if not completely improvised. And in this case, he's using both acrylic and oil paints. So as we look at it, really, the way to understand this piece is not as a loose conglomeration of these images, but rather as sort of a modernist still life, something where we would expect a skull sitting on a table next to a bone as our memento mori, maybe an arrow in the background suggesting a form of tragic death, the scales possibly suggesting the afterlife, and the leaves, life itself, because this vine, of course, would be a living thing, except we see it in a skeletal form, reminding us that all things must pass on.